Yeah, hello and welcome. Uh, good afternoon in the US and good evening in Germany. Welcome to uh, this event, to this video conference uh, hosted by Atlantic Booker and entitled Political Polarization in the USA, How to Bridge the Gap. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure and privilege to welcome a very special guest today, uh, former US Senator Barbara Boxer. Welcome, Senator. It's great to have you on this call. A uh, great opportunity for our institution to join the conversation with you. Uh, we very much look looking forward to hearing your perspectives on that topic and, and also further transatlantic issues that we already talked about before this uh, call. Um, and also, this is my uh, opportunity to thank some uh, trusted friends and partners who helped us to set up this event. Um, and this is first and foremost, our member, David Noah, um, probably the, the most well-known uh, American in the membership of Atlantic Booker and a good friend who always helps us to get things done and open doors. Thank you so much, David, for doing that um, yet again. And uh, I would also like to thank um, two friends in the US, Brian Lanza and Morris Reed uh, from Mercury, which is an agency based in DC, uh, focusing on uh, public policy, um, who will also join the conversation um, after about half an hour. First of all, we start, start off with the Senator and then also include you in the discussion. And also um, I'm delighted that we have one of our young leader alumna and young members of Atlantic Brücke, Marie Astrid Langer, who is the US correspondent for Neue Zürcher Zeitung, NZZ, based in San Francisco, who has kindly agreed to moderate this call. And with that, I would like to hand over to you, David, to uh, say a couple of introductory words. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, and, and welcome everyone. You know, the Atlantic Brücke and, and David, all the work that David does has been putting on so many excellent events during the time of Corona when we can't meet and have a beer at the bar like we'd like to do. And I thought, you know, when you hear about all these different events and see what we've done, it would be very interesting to have a talk with somebody who not only has a very distinguished uh, career of her own, but also knows some of the key players extremely well, having served with President Biden with Kamala Harris, with John Kerry, and so many important people, she knows them. And so you'll get a viewpoint that you don't get from most people. And I also thought by, you know, reaching out to Senator, to the Democratic Senator Boxer, I could show all of my friends at Atlantic Brooker that your token Republican can be also very bipartisan. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're going to be in for quite a discussion. And later on, as we said, Brian and, and Morris will join two very good friends of mine for many, many years. One is a Democrat, one is a Republican. They're extremely well knowledgeable of what's going on in the US and globally in many places. So please enjoy the fruitful discussion and let me turn it over now to Marie. Thank you, David. And hello to everyone who's watching from wherever you are tuning in. I have the great honor today to talk with Senator Barbara Boxer, the former Senator of my current home state of California. Senator Boxer is originally from Brooklyn, but she relocated with her husband to California, to be precise, to Marin County, just north of San Francisco in the 1970s. In 1982, Senator Boxer was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where she served for 10 years, until she was elected Senator for California in 1992. Together with Senator Dianne Feinstein, she represented California in the Senate for 24 years. During that time, Senator Boxer was a forceful advocate for families, children, consumers, and the environment. And she was also a member on the prestigious Foreign Relations Committee, where she worked side by side with Senator Joe Biden, now, of course, President Joe Biden. In 2017, Senator Boxer chose to retire from the Senate. Her successor was Kamala Harris, now Vice President Harris. Last year, she joined Mercury, a global public strategy firm, and is now co-chair in Mercury's Los Angeles office. Senator Boxer has also written several books, both fiction and nonfiction. And let me tell you, several of her former staff members have reassured me that she was the smartest, warmest, and most engaged hands-on person they've ever worked with. 
Welcome, Senator Boxer, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us here at Atlantic Puga today. Well, thank you for that warm introduction. It means a lot to me. Thank you. You left DC in early 2017, which seems like a lifetime ago, <laughs> the same year that the Trump era started. Are you glad you got out of DC when you did? Well, I have to say yes. And I don't, and it's not a quick answer because on the one hand, I, I know I would have been so frustrated. Um, as Brian knows, cause he's worked closely uh, with, uh, in government for so long, you want to get something done. And I was so proud of what I was able to get done. And let me be clear, uh, when I wrote my last book, which uh, was about my life and politics, um, I went through 1,000 1, provisions of mine that became law, not one of which could have become law without Republican support. And so now you look at what we're going to focus on, uh, this terrible, terrible situation where there's doesn't seem to be room for compromise. Uh, I think I would... I would be miserable, <laughs> to be honest. And so, and also some of the things that Trump said and did and the hatred that was unleashed, I, I, think, I, I think I wouldn't have been productive. So I think I'm doing more <laughs> outside. And when I left, I founded a political action committee and I volunteered for it. And I was able to help, you know, elect some really good people. So I think, and then finding Mercury was a dream because as Brian will tell you, we're very bipartisan, so it reflects a whole other kind of thing that can happen. We find the things that we can work together on, and it's a beautiful thing. And if you can't, if you don't feel comfortable, if somebody comes and, you, and I don't feel like I can really help them, I say that. So, so the answer, it's a, of course, when you ask a senator a question, it's always a long answer, but, <laughs> but I'm glad I left. Um, I'm sad what happened to the country. Yes. Can you take us a little bit into the weeds? Because you have a unique perspective, both as an insider for so many years and as an outsider nowadays. How exactly have you analyzed, has, um, has Congress changed? Like, how would you, where do you see the root causes mm -hmm. for that partisanship that we all in, in Europe witness these days? Well, I mean, because I've been in politics for so long, I'm gonna give you a very personal answer. I chose to be a Democrat my whole life because I believe that that party has always stood for hope, opportunity, and fairness. Now, to be honest, the Republican Party, they also said they stood for hope, opportunity, and, so, and they did. And the question was, how do you get there? And, you know, the parties, and, and, and I know it's more complicated in Europe because there are so many parties, we've got two parties, essentially. So the question is, what do you stand for? And, and, and I think most would agree that over the years, the basic difference the parties had was, what is the role of government? We all wanted fairness. We all wanted equality. We all wanted success. We all wanted prosperity, everybody. But what's the role of government? And Democrats tend to think you really have to uh, make sure that you don't just say you're for a clean environment, but you've got some rules. <laughs> and Republicans tended to say, oh no, that's putting your, your foot on the pedal. And that was a fair debate. And the first time I ran for office was really a long time ago. It was the first, the only race I lost. I won 11 straight elections, but I lost the first one in 1972 for a local office. And, you know, the, the agreement with other candidates was so obvious. Everyone was pro-choice, that's not the case anymore. Everyone was pro-environment, that's not the case anymore. Everyone was for women's rights, it's not the case anymore. Civil rights, everyone was fighting over who could write a better you know, law to make sure that all of our minorities uh, could vote. So it's been a sad thing for me to see. And, and you know, again, look, I'm a Democrat. I'm not, I'm not coming here without my biases, but I am very discouraged at what has happened to the Republican Party. And there's a lot of great Republicans out there who are also very discouraged. And I think we're gonna see some type of realignment here um, because it's just, uh, it's a party that has become 
uh, so um, the party of no, we can't do anything, we can't fix anything. And then, and I'll close with this, the Trump, a Trump just appealed to the worst in people. And this whole notion of how do we win elections from the Republican party standpoint, gee, we can't really reach out to anybody. Let's just try to suppress the vote. And we see in all the states now, these horrifyingly horrible, uh, the worst laws being proposed since Jim Crow. So I think this president unleashed some things and I am praying and hopeful that the Republicans who still believe in hope, opportunity and fairness and justice and all the things they did when, when I was growing up in politics, maybe they'll become independent voters. I'm not saying they become Democrats, they still don't agree, but maybe they'll be the power base that will decide and see what the new Republican Trump party comes up with and the Democrats come up with and they'll pick who they think is the best. That's my analysis of it. Mm -hmm. So you just characterized the lack of common ground between the two parties. How much of that do you blame to the figure of Donald Trump and how much do you think is in a, like a larger intrinsic problem within the GOP that independent of Trump or not um, mm -hmm. needs to be fixed? Look, the Republican Party has been changing over the years. Um, again, I'm a Democrat, this is my view, and, and others may have a very different perspective, which I would respect. But again, I saw a liaison between fundamentalism and the Republican Party and the party that was very pro-choice. George Herbert Walker Bush was on the board of Planned Parenthood. A woman's right to choose was a Republican issue. Trust me when I say that, I was there. And you know now they decided to uh, to work with the fundamentalist groups, and you can't find common ground anywhere, and it's very difficult. We can't even get the Equal Rights Amendment uh, added to the Constitution because the far right of the Republican Party, not all of them, say, "Oh, if you have an Equal Rights Amendment, that will guarantee a woman abortion." Well, that's not even true. But that's what has happened. So I think it's been, you know, these new coalitions that took place over time. Uh, and, and, and then the issue of the environment. Uh, I, I mean, I, that's an, it's so, such an important issue in Germany, in Europe, all over the world and in America. Again, I would, when I first ran, I was fighting with the Republicans over who was a better environmentalist. And all of a sudden, we see the special interests decided to go big and give big do donations and contributions and uh, very good support to the Republican Party. And so now, when I started out as chair of the Environment Committee, I had a lot of Republicans who said they wanted to vote for a law that would put a price on carbon. And then two years later, when we had it up there, we did get a few Republican votes, but very few. And today, I don't think there'd be any. I really don't think so. So mm -hmm. there have been changes. But then the last point I make is Trump. What Trump did, and by the way, I don't think he was a Republican or a Democrat or anything. He's Trump. And I think uh, he just decided what he wanted to push were, were, were some things that were, were stunning to me. Um, a lot of bigotry, a lot of statements about people who were veterans and people who were disabled and people of color. And, um, and I don't think the Republican party was any, anything like that, but he became so popular that I think a lot of my Republican friends are afraid that if they stand up too, too strongly as did Liz Cheney and about five other very brave Republicans in the house on impeachment, that there'll be history. And so at the end of the day, it's up to the American people what they want. And that's why I think it's too late. I don't know, I could be wrong. And Brian and others could have another, and David could have another view of the future of the Republican party. But my sense is it's gonna be the party of Trump and it's not gonna be a winning party. And uh, so a lot of good caring Republicans, again, 
will become, I think, the power brokers and should and, 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 and join league with moderate Democrats. So we going to see maybe this realignment. I'm the only one that's talking about that. Most people don't believe that will happen. But mm -hmm. I see it happening when I look at the Lincoln Project and other things. I see uh, mainstream Republicans, the old Republicans that had a very clear path, you know, as little government as possible, but standing up for the rights of everybody. I think that and certainly for the rights of democracy, that group could, could be the power brokers of the future in American politics, uh, because I know in, it's very different than a parliamentary system. It's all about people. When I ran for the Senate, it's all about me. If Brian ran for the House, it's all about him. We don't, it's not a parliamentary system. You're not on a list. You got to fight for yourself. And so we're very independent in that. So mm -hmm. I, I do th see a lot of, unless things change, and I can't see them changing, uh, I think we're going to see this shift, but we'll see. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. Um, a lot of people in Europe and also some people in the US were saying that maybe um, a tragic event would manage to unite the country to bring the divided country together, just like we saw on 9-11 now 20 years ago when you were in Congress. And when we saw those horrific images and those horrific incidents on January 6th um, on the Capitol, uh, we all thought that maybe that's the moment that going to unite the country again, right? Senator, why do you think um, that 1-6, January 6th, not have the same effect on the country um, and bringing Congress and, and lawmakers together as 9-11 had? Okay, um, I'm going to ask that in two ways. Uh, first, I'm going to give you what I view as a very positive thing that happened on that day after this insurrection. Um, and I just want to say, as someone who spent 24 years in the United States Senate, 10 years in the House, when I saw those people march in there, break in there, attack police officers, uh, despoil, I don't even want to go into it, what they did uh, with their filthy, I, I can't go that way. It, it, it was an out of body experience for me. And I was, I was, I couldn't talk. I was, you know, and you could see I'm a talker. <laughs> I couldn't talk. And people were calling me and I couldn't take the calls because I didn't know what to say. And, and there's so many levels to this, this unleashing of hate, uh, you know, I have to say, I agree with Liz Cheney and those who voted to impeach the president on this. He encouraged this, plain and simple. March down there. I'll march with you. Noah, he didn't do that. Uh, go, go, go tell those people what to, they were trying to overturn an election, which the Trump administration said was the most secure election in the nation's history. That's not me saying it or anybody else. The Trump administration said this most secure election in history. And he encouraged them to, to march with their, uh, they had weapons. Uh, I, I don't know if any of them had guns, but they certainly had uh, spray, chemical spray. They had poles. They killed, they killed people. And they wanted to hunt down Mike Pence for God's sake. And you're right to say, why wouldn't that unite us? This, they were after Mike Pence, the, the vice president to Trump, the most loyal vice president you've ever seen. They had a gallows at, uh, that they built out there, okay? And they were hunting Nancy, Nancy, and saying things that every woman, it makes your skin crawl, like from a horror movie where the, where the attacker is in your house yelling your wife's name. Where are you, honey? You know, I'll tell you something. Um, your question is so on point. The moment that it did unite us was that night. Because remember, what they were disrupting and trying to wreck was the peaceful transfer of power. And there was so much heroics all across our government. 
including the clerk who thought of picking up those uh, those ballots that had come in from the states and running out of the chamber with them. So the heroics of the Capitol Police, the heroics of both leaders of both sides deciding in the, in the wake of this historic attack, we hadn't seen it on our Capitol since the War of 1812, to go back to work, to clean up the environment there, to go back to work and to have Mike Pence do that that night and to have Nancy Pelosi do it that night and Mitch McConnell do it that night and even Kevin McCarthy do it that night and go back and count those votes. That to me was a moment that we should never, never, never overlook because we can all fall into this trap of saying, you know, nothing, nothing good happened that was a good thing that happened. It was like the night I was there after 9-11 and everyone went outside the Capitol and sang the national anthem, all of us. Now, what happened since then kind of went back to business as normal. And the country I think is united against what happened. But again, it gets back to you know, the party of Trump and that's what we're facing. Um, we're facing it in so many ways in America, Vaccines going great. 50% of Republican men won't get a vaccine. What is that about? And I'm so glad Trump said today, get a vaccine. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's so, sort of like a cultish situation. I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't know about, although my husband will tell you I am. I charge him quite a bit for all of the help I give him every day. But, um, you know, it's stunning to me what has happened. Mm -hmm. Now, there is obviously a different, a totally different administration in place. And, you know, President Joe Biden very well. You guys go way back. Which side of him do we on the other side of the Atlantic and Germany not really get to see that you've experienced, though? What, what makes you optimistic that he's the right president for this moment in history. Joe Biden looks in the eyes of anybody and sees the good, just he does. And, and you know, even if people are telling him, oh, don't trust that guy, don't trust that gal. You know, he is, um, he's a very, he's a deeply religious spiritual person. And, <clears throat> and he lives it, he, he doesn't just talk it. And I don't know that the people in Europe understand that. And um, he also, he, so he loves people. He sees us all as God's children. He, um, he has compassion, but he also knows that he's gonna get things done. And he'll take it, he'll try everything, everything he can uh, to, to get Republican votes. He will. Uh, no matter what, but he isn't going to walk away. He's not going to be a fool on that. He's going to get it done. And as he said many times, uh, I want to work in this first bill <clears throat> that, we, that he did to uh, heal America, to get us back, uh, the rescue plan, he called it. Uh, it's large and it's going to uh, have a huge impact in getting us out of the mess we're in. Uh, he tried very hard. He, as a matter of fact, his first meeting with we're about uh, was with about six Republicans to try and um, get their support. And they said they would support a bill, but it had to be cut by two thirds. So to me, that's like if you go to the doctor and you're really sick, like this economy is sick and people are sick and dying of COVID, you go to the doctor and he says, you have this really bad cancer, but guess what? I have a cure. Three pills a day three pills a day, and you take one pill a day, you cut it back by two thirds, no, 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 you're not gonna recover. It's gonna be, it's going to be painful to watch you suffer. He wasn't about to do that with this economy. And when Janet Yellen, who was a, a liberal Democrat, who is now the treasurer, and Jerome Powell, who is a Trump appointee said, go big, this is a problem, and don't worry about inflation, it could go to 2%. Um, he decided he was going to go big or not go at all. So I think we're seeing, if I see any change in Joe, 
it's that he's not going to give up uh, if he can't get you know the broadest support. And he had the support among Republicans in the country, he had quite a bit, uh, maybe 40% or more, 50 maybe, on this rescue plan. So he decided he would move forward. But I think this, this belief in humankind, and when he says, when we together, we can do it, he believes it, it's not rhetoric. It's not a speech writer, you know, it's him. Mm -hmm. That's really reassuring to hear. Um, you not only know um, President Biden well, you also endorsed Kamala Harris back in uh, 2016 when she ran for the Senate and managed to become your successor. And now she has very quickly ascended to the vice presidency. Yes. What's your take on what's the dynamic between her and President Biden? They're obviously, they seem to be working very closely together. Um, what, what's your take on how much leverage she has and what the dynamic between the two of them is? It's a great question. I'll, I'll answer it the best I can because obviously only they could answer it. But um, here's the thing. You have to know that during the campaign, and I know Brian will remember this because he watched, I'm sure, every debate. Um, Kamala Harris was tough on Joe Biden. She was tough on him. And she went straight at him on, on some uh, <laughs> civil rights issue. And I, I went, uh, oh my God. And um, what overcame that when he decided to choose her is that they have a very strong relationship because she was very close to his son, Bo, and um, who, who passed away of cancer, struggled. And, uh, and Bo was a, you know, an up and coming politician who was the attorney general of Delaware. And Joe Biden had amazing hopes and dreams for his son. And uh, he often said, I thought Bo would be president, not me. You know, that, that was in his head. And so because of that warm relationship, it, he was able to overcome that attack. I gotta tell you, if someone had attacked me like that, I would have said, oh my God, really? But that shows you how Joe, you know, how, he, how he's forgiving and how he values their relationship beyond that particular incident. And so I think it's a very warm relationship um, because it's it came through family organically because Kamala and Bo were both attorneys general. That's how they got to be very friendly. She in California, he in Delaware. So um, <clears throat> my sense of it is he brings her in on everything because that's what Barack Obama did. And Barack Obama, you know, basically said, Joe, you'll be the last one to leave the room. And I think that, that he's doing that with her. So she knows everything that he wants to do. I know he asks her for her opinion. She's very smart, she gets it. Um, and because she ran for president and held office for quite a while in California, she's got a lot of experience on you know, how to deliver a message, how to be supportive. But I think she'll be exceedingly uh, loyal and supportive of him. I think she'll be involved in every decision he makes, whether she gets her way or not. I don't think, I mean, it's all, he's the president, but I think he will include her quite a bit. One last thing, uh, she'll probably wind up with a particular portfolio. That means, you know, some work that she'll be responsible for. I don't know what that will be, but that will come over the next couple of months. We'll see what he feels she could be doing for him that would be the best, whether it's, whether it's at home or abroad. It could be either. And since we're talking in this intimate circle, I'm, I'm gonna grab the opportunity and ask you, do you think Joe Biden is gonna run again in 24? Ah. Or do you think Harris will? Oh God, you're making me tired. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't got a clue. It, you know, it all depends on how you feel. I'm very old and I'm very perky, you know, and other people are old at 40. So I don't know. You know, I, again, it really depends. We'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see how beat up he gets, how bad the Republicans are going to beat up on him. We'll see. <laughs> Yeah, a lot can change in, in three years. <laughs> right. Um, 
Before we start our Q&A uh, now, I would like to extend the welcome um, to this round to Brian Lanza and Maurice Reed, who are both partners at Mercury. And like David Nauer, who you met at the beginning, both gentlemen helped and assisted us in setting up this event today and will be available to answer questions now along with Senator Boxer. Brian Lanza is a partner in Mercury's Washington DC office specializing in public affairs and media strategy. He is also the former communications director for President Donald J. Trump's transition team. Morris Reed is a partner at Mercury as well, and he has worked with high profile public and private sector clients worldwide for more than 15 years. Welcome to Brian and Morris. And um, now we would like to include a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna take this opportunity before, um, and I'm probably gonna start uh, with a question that's really been on my mind when it comes to transatlantic relationships before I, um, while I get a chance to look at the questions from the audio uh, from the audience, which is um, Senator Boxer, a lot of, or whoever wants to answer this, um, a lot of Europeans were honestly a little relieved when President Biden was elected because they were hoping that things would go back to the normal, to, to normalcy basically. Um, on the other hand, I'm always wondering what the expectations of Americans are towards their German ally, right? Because Donald Trump rightly pointed out a couple of issues in the relationship, just like when it comes to defense spending, for instance. And I'm, I would love to hear from our American friends what the US expects from Germany in return. Ryan, why don't you kick it off and I'll follow you. And of course, of course, Senator. Yeah. You know, listen, I would say, you know, at least what Trump and the Republicans expected, it was the, the, the Germany's, you know, prioritize uh, the, the NATO relationship. And they look at it from the standpoint of if it's a priority, you know, you're gonna pay for that priority because, you know, budgets are priorities. And they feel that the that the, the the German side hasn't carried their fair share of the the funding of of that relationship, and that strains that. And they also look at some of the strategic energy decisions that Germany has done uh, in the past couple of years with Nord Stream two, uh, and that highlights the fact is like you know first of all you know you have NATO to counter against Russia, uh, and now you have a NATO you know one of the NATO leaders actually facilitating you know. Um, you know, LNG, you know, with Russia, oil with Russia, you know, that raises a red flag with Republicans, you know, who are like, wait a second, they're not paying their fair share. And now they're facilitating and giving money to the Russians where you have this organization that was created to stop the expansion of Russia. I think that that consternation, you know, gives, you know, the, the Republicans that are not the neocons that, you know, the, 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 the support engagement reason to draw back and say, you know, listen, they're not prioritizing their needs. Why do we need to pay and prioritize Germans needs ourselves? Uh, I think that's dangerous. Uh, I think we've seen that danger in the past, but I think that's very much how you know the the Republicans, at least the Trump Republicans, see that relationship. Mm -hmm. Senator, please. Sure. Um, I when we were preparing for this, I, I sort of immersed myself in that whole pipeline issue. Called a few people to get mm -hmm. a sense uh, from some think tanks that advise uh, Biden and so on. And the sense that I get is, you know, there's there's just from the Democratic side, and not all Democrats, just from what I think is going on. Remember, I think this is what I'm piecing together. I think um, it, that certainly one of Joe's top, I don't think, I know that one of Joe Biden's top priorities is strengthening his alliances. And that means first and foremost, NATO and uh, with a lot of our Asian allies as well, but it's very important to, to him. And he feels very warm toward Merkel. And he, and he, at the same time, no one, no one likes or supports or thinks it's a great idea to work with Val Vladimir Putin, especially now after what happened, he, you know, you treated uh, Navalny and now Navalny's in some prison somewhere this doesn't sit right with America. It does not sit right. And I think that goes across, um, across party lines. It's, sort of, it's almost um, shocking in a way that this has happened. And um, I know it's difficult. And I don't think that, I don't believe that Joe Biden is going to uh, 
ruin his relationship with Germany over this in any way, shape or form. He is not going to, mm -hmm. but he's going to be honest about it. He's going to say, why? What, how does this make sense? And how are you going to protect Ukraine? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it'll be, you know, what Brian was very forthcoming in stating the Republican point of view. And I think the Democratic point of view is sort of Brian lands a light. Uh, in other words, what Brian says is right, but how do you handle it in a more diplomatic way, you know, which is, I think, what uh, what Joe Biden will try to do. Again, this is, I'm not making news. I'm just forecasting what I think as I, uh, as I, as I talk. I do think paying fair share is, is critical and everyone should do it. We should do it. <laughs> we, we didn't do it for a while under Trump and uh, everybody should. This is a cold, cruel world. We've got anti-democratic forces all over the world threatening democracy. There is no book in, you know, that is a sacred tablet that says democracy will live on forever. We have to fight for it. We have to work for it. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it, as I, I, I think Brian is right to raise the issues he raised. There are little red flags there, but, you know, I think that what Joe would want to do is uh, handle them very diplomatically and try to resolve them without it coming to a big, ugly, Mm -hmm. Last point is there's going to be an election in Germany. I don't have to tell you that. And this whole pipeline thing could be out of the hands of the current leader. So, yeah. 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 And I'm sure um, in, in Europe, the diplomatic tone is going to be greatly appreciated, especially after the last four years. Um, I would like to, again, encourage our um, listeners and our audience to ask questions. Um, embrace the opportunity while you can and just um, enter your questions in the chat function. In the meantime, I got a um, question um, from regarding the relationship with China, because that's clearly, um, that has clearly in the past been a point of tension between the US and Europe. What would you say could be the priorities for an alliance US plus Europe against China? What should be the priorities? Senator, I'll go first if you don't mind. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be human rights. Uh, I think with the Joe Biden administration and the Democratic Party that just puts such a strong emphasis on human rights, and you bump that up against the European Union, Germany, you know, and UK, who speak about these things as, as, as fundamental as oxygen, you know, you sort of create that atmosphere where these two countries can get together, or these two, you know, not countries, these two regions get together and help, you know, counterbalance what's happening in, in China with respect to human rights. And then at the end of the day, I think the best thing that the, the countries need to do, you know, these not countries, these two alliances need to do in the counter China is to figure out how to deal with Chinese technology. Uh, you have a regime in China that's using it in a very authoritarian way, uh, technology that we hadn't been we hadn't envisioned would be used this way, and it's raised a lot of red flags. And uh, I think until you you know, U.S. can't do that alone. In spite of Trump trying to do it alone, he he did a little bit in uh, in, in getting the U.K. supportive of some of the the Huawei issues against China. But I, I think we'll probably see Biden use a much broader uh, coalition. Uh, to, to tackle uh, the, the threat of Chinese technology and the continued threat of Chinese human rights. Okay, I would love to hear from Morris on this and then I'll clean up. First of all, I think there has to be a strategic recognition that China is a competitor. So let's, let's not put them in the enemy category, but certainly there needs to be uh, the strategic recognition that they are a competitor uh, mm -hmm. and that all uh, the European countries need to be on the same page. But some of the challenges, as you guys know, is that some of the smaller, particularly Balkan countries are flirty uh, with China. So once there's a, a strategic recognition that they are a competitor, uh, it needs to first and foremost focus on economics. Uh, we've seen you know, the challenges of relying too heavily on China during the pandemic. Uh, so the supply chains issue must be addressed. Uh, I think fundamental to what Biden is trying to do uh, is to get the U.S. House in order. Trump started some of this. Uh, and, you know, as Brian know, I always say, there was always a message uh, in what Trump was trying to do. He just got in the way of that message most of the time. And so I think once the strategic recognition is uh, the, the foundation of the framework, focusing on the supply chain uh, and engaging China. 
uh, there is no way that uh, the world would be a safer place if China's not engaged. Uh, we, we, we've seen the success of engaging your adversaries and enemies all around the world. Uh, and I think Biden will do that. He's a much more of a guy that likes to engage, keep people at the table. Uh, but it's fundamental to understand that China is a strategic competitor. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could uh, comment, I couldn't agree more with both of my friends. Uh, I, I think they just laid it out. And just to, just to pick up on something that Mara said, this notion of, of, of not seeing China as an enemy, which Trump did. And it was like, forget about Russia. I like them, they're helping me win. Let's go after China, and uh, you know this is this is not going to happen uh, with uh, with Biden. But I agree, he's going to be tough on human rights. He has to be, otherwise, you know, we we would lose our way. But there, he's not going to see them as an enemy, as Mara said. He's going to see them, uh, yes, an adversarial relationship in some ways, but also a competitive relationship in many other ways. Um, when I was in. I can't believe how long ago this was. We had a vote on, I think we were in the House at the time. I don't remember, House or Senate I was in. And we voted on whether to open up uh, relations, trading relations uh, with uh, China and you know, to, to make them a trading partner. And uh, I voted to make them a trading partner. And I got, you know, uh, it was one of those positions where you were either loved or hated for it. But to me, the, what drove me was North Korea. Do we really want China to become another North Korea? God help us all. And so I think it, Biden's coming in the nick of time because I think we were kind of headed in that direction, um, you know, uh, with Trump. So I do think we're going to see uh, see us uh, be very diplomatic and strong on human rights, on technology. Uh, and, and trade and working with Europe um, is going to be so important. Look, Joe Biden has said it 100 ways to Sunday. He cannot, you know, when you're dealing with foreign relations, it has to be with allies. So I think you're going to be totally involved in this uh, every minute. I'm sure a lot of people really like to hear that um, because that's not been the tone for the past couple of years. Um, yeah. And now turning to the questions from the audience, we have one question, um, which is uh, Joe Biden emphasized during his impressive inauguration speech that he would focus on healing the US again, replace hate by dialogue and open it. Is it realistic in your opinion that this is objective will be reached given the growing gap between the two parties? Well, I'll take a stab. This is really an issue of my heart. And um, what I said before when we were talking that what does break my heart is to see the differences in the parties now, not with every member of the Republican party, but to just see one party pushing for uh, voting rights and the John Lewis bill that's so important um, and another party trying to stymie uh, voting. And now we have more hate crimes than ever now against the Asian American community. I don't know if you've heard about that in Germany. Uh, horrifying things are happening. Horrifying things are happening to elderly uh, uh, Asian Americans who were just out for a walk. And, and, and these hate crimes, a, a couple have been killed, thrown to the ground because uh, Trump said the China virus. I mean, it is, um, it really, it brings tears. It's, it's, it's rough. And um, how, do we, how do we bring about the healing? Um, it's a too long of a discussion. It's something we have to look inside ourselves and it's not even political, but, but cutting to the chase in terms of politics. Um, I think business can make a real difference here. What we're seeing now in America with these states that are trying to pass these Jim Crow laws, and if you don't know what Jim Crow, that was the period of time where, um, you know, Southerners um, tried to do everything to stop uh, African Americans from voting. Um, these are coming back. Now, business is starting to wake up Coca-Cola, others, and say, cut it out. 
you know, we, we're in your state, Georgia, and we don't like it. And, you know, I've seen them do this before with gay rights in America, where the, you know, where the private sector comes in. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with these, with the Voting Rights Act. It doesn't look good right now. It looks like the parties are in their corners. I'm not sure. And they may just get rid of the filibuster in order to vote in the Voting Rights Act. How they'll do that, it, technically, I, I can't tell you. But if you, if, if you get rid of the filibuster, you can do something with 51 votes. You can only do it a couple of times in a Congress. So um, I'll stop there. I think the business sector is our hope, working with the Biden administration as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think the polarization in the U.S. is something that's really unsettling to a lot of Germans to observe because um, you always, the U.S. has always had a function of like the Northern Star um, in the past couple of decades. And that is also reflected in the questions that we get from the audience. Another one that I would like to address now talks about this polarization. Senator, you said quite vividly how Donald Trump unleashed the terrible events on January 6th. This implies that there was something underlying that was unleashed. What has happened in American society for such previously unimaginable events to happen and not to be wholeheartedly condemned? Look, I, <laughs> it's gonna take historians and sociologists to understand <clears throat> what was unleashed on this country um, there's a lot of layers to it. Uh, people feeling, uh, you know, the middle class not getting uh, what they thought they needed. We have a minimum wage that's so low that you have to work three jobs in order to, to, to make it. So you have a, a part of society that's just upset. And then look, it's no different than history has shown us. What happens when that occurs? And then you get a leader who appeals to the worst in you and who doesn't even try to appeal to the best in you. Beat him up, you know? Look, he's disabled. You know, he's not a hero. He's not a hero because he got injured in the war. He's a loser. This is what we had. Mexican Americans, thighs the size of whatever he said. Melons, I don't know what he said, it's disgusting. My, my African American. What you say? <laughs> I think that I think fundamental to this is just a lack of leadership. Uh, and when you look at some of the challenges that that America is facing, all the world is facing. There's opportunity gaps, uh, and the real problem is that there was not a, enough strategic planning. So clearly, if you look at some of the pockets of poverty and some of the pocket of, of anxiety, economic anxiety in America. Uh, this shouldn't happen overnight. Uh, and it was a lack of leadership that really uh, identified these issues uh, and planned accordingly. Uh, but when you look, you know, and this is a challenge, I'm a Democrat, but this is one of the challenges that I have of my party uh, is that you know, we continue to think that the Republicans are gonna do something different. They're, they are exercising power. And if you look at Mitch McConnell and what he did under Barack Obama, what he did under Donald Trump, and now what he's doing under Joe Biden, it's a pure power play. Uh, the Democrats need to understand that, uh, stop expecting them to do something different, uh, and they need to really fundamentally engage voters because the only way to change politics uh, is to expand your base, right? Mm -hmm. Senator knows that she's been elected lots of time. Uh, the challenge for the Republican Party is their base is contracting. Uh, and there's when you have a contraction of your base and you have a lack of economic opportunity, you create these type of anxiety. And when you have someone that fuels the fire, that's when things explode. Uh, so from my standpoint, it's purely a lack of leadership. And this is fundamental to the world. You know, the real question is, where are the barber boxers of the future? Uh, and what are we going to do to make sure that there's you know, we're addressing the fact that there's a lack of leadership in economic anxiety? not just with white Americans, but with all Americans. And frankly, it's fundamental around the world. People are looking mm -hmm. for leadership and the leaders need to step up. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could just put a little more optimism, I was getting to it as I was going through all of Trump's nasty. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was optimistic, sorry. No, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the difference between you and me. 
So I'll, I'll be a little more optimistic because I do think, um, you know, as Morris points out, all the everything that everything that was under I, what I was trying to do is to talk about what were the underlying factors that allowed not a lack of leadership, Trump's leadership, which was dark, which was which was appealing to the worst in people, and I think that came about over the years because we've had these underlying problems with the, and I'll say this, and I don't know that Morris would agree with me or Brian or anybody else, but I've seen a graph that's really fascinating. Uh, this guy wrote a book and he said, he, went, he, he wanted to focus on the difference between the rich and poor in America, you know, just the, the data, nothing, no editorial comment. So you go back to the Gilded Age, which was the early 1900s, okay? And it was, and it was the worst possible time in history. It was down here because it was so bad. There was no parity. As you move up, you get to 1960s, and it's interesting. That was a huge amount of progress in terms of the difference between the rich and poor in America. Okay, you know the difference between a CEO and a worker. All right. Now, after 64, 1964, all of a sudden, and the historians can explain it. I don't sure I can. It goes right back down straight to where it is now where it was in the Gilded Age. So people are, as Morris said, they are nervous. They are looking for leadership and that leadership came in. So here's my optimism here. Trump is gone and we now have a leader who gets it and who is going to address these issues. Now it's only been 58 days or 59 days since he's been. So we have to give him a little time. But but yes, there needs to be, as Mara says, this type of leadership. I hope it comes from Joe Biden. I hope it comes from leaders of both parties. I hope, I hope. Mm -hmm. A lot of fears that um, both you, Senada, and Morris just described are also somehow connected to fear of foreigners, right, of, of to xenophobia. And currently we witness a huge influx, like the largest influx um, of migrants at the southern border in the US. And I'm really curious to hear your take on how the Biden administration is gonna tackle this issue because they've been very liberal and, and very progressive in their promises towards um, migrants. But at the same time, we already have um, about 11 million um, people without uh, valid papers in the U.S. And that conflict, that like the lack of a proper immigration reform totally has potential to feed into the issues that you were just uh, describing. How do you, so I guess my question is, how do you think can, um, can the Biden administration solve that huge issue, like that huge problem that's driving towards it with 100 miles per hour right now? Well, I'll start it off and then I'll give it over to my colleagues. Uh, because being a, a, someone from California, seeing this and having dealt with this issue for all my political life and having spoken to Senator Padilla just yesterday about this, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. There's two things. There's a short term issue, which I will get to now, which is what's happening there now, which is a, a mess, okay, right now. And then there's a the longer term issue of how do you deal with this so you don't have this in the future. Mm -hmm. In um, 2013, I was part of a group that in the Senate, 68 of us passed an immigration reform bill. It was terrific. It was terrible, so bipartisan. You know, uh, uh, John McCain led the battle, Lindsey Graham and all the people that you now know were all involved in it. And Chuck Schumer, Dick Durbin, and it passed overwhelmingly. It, it set up a whole new way of dealing with people who arrive illegally with courts and uh, surges of lawyers and, and courts to the border. It dealt with uh, you know, how, to, how to enforce the laws at the border. It dealt with fencing. It dealt with um, every issue, the dreamers, all of those things. Okay, it went over to Paul Ryan and he never brought it up, which was such a bad mistake because we would have had the law and we wouldn't be in a mess. We're in a mess. So the first thing when you deal with a problem is be honest, we're in a mess. The one thing I like about Joe and his team is they, they, they say we're overwhelmed with this because they didn't know it. Now here's the deal. The border is closed. 
right now because of COVID. However, they have decided to let in 25,000 people who are seeking asylum. Outside of that, they're not taking anybody in except unaccompanied minors because they don't want these kids to wind up, you know, being stuck in Mexico by themselves or searching and they're gonna place them. What they have to do now, and I'm really glad my Orcus is the head of Homeland and that FEMA is part of Homeland Security Department. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Administration and they, have, they housed all the people after Katrina, et cetera. They're gonna get some housing right now. They're gonna deal with this mess. But look, <laughs> there are struggles all over the world. And as Joe Biden said, we have to get to the heart of why people are leaving their homeland. Why did my people leave? Because they were scared to death that the a czar was gonna kill them. <laughs> so why did my people leave? You know, my grandma and grandpa, they got out of there. They got out of there. Strangers in a strange land, this is not easy. They, could, they couldn't talk a word of English, it was hard. And um, people don't leave unless they're scared like hell. So we've got to get long-term immigration reform done and we've got to have a short-term surge of help at the border. And I think they'll do that. Brian Morris, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I, I'd like to add a little bit to it. A Californian, you know, I'm a Californian like the senator. Uh, you know, parents are immigrants, Mexican American. You know, I would I would say, you know, listen, the rhetoric works. As as difficult, as painful, as hurtful some of the rhetoric it was about the border, you know, President Trump rhetoric did prevent a lot of these, you know, unaccompanied minors from making that dangerous transition through Central America to Mexico most likely hired through coyotes, most likely assaulted you know, at various levels along the way. You know, the president's rhetoric, you know, as difficult, as painful as a Mexican-American is, it worked. It stopped, you know, it's it significantly reduced the people willing to come here because they saw it, they, they saw, they knew there was going to be tough you know, enforcement at the border. You know, Biden and Kamala Harris, you know, I mean, maybe this is a disagreement we have with the senator, but I mean, they support open borders. And so when you send that message out, to, to Central America, to, to Latin America, you're going to get people who are going to say, hey, the system's changed. And now's our opportunity to come. And that's why you're hearing the Biden administration saying, don't come now. Like they're overwhelmed. But they shouldn't be surprised that their open border rhetoric is why we have the situation we have along the southern border now. Senator's right. There are deep, long institutional issues of why they come here. Central America, it's violence. Um, more drug related violence or economic conditions. It was different for her and her family, you know, escaping the czar. But at the end of the day, you know, the southern border is a unique thing because people can actually travel to get there instead of crossing an ocean to get there. And when your rhetoric, when your rhetoric says, hey, this isn't a priority, come here, you're going to get parents who are just so desperate for an opportunity for their kids, they're going to shove them on the bus, they're going to shove them on the train, cross their fingers, pray for the best. And that just can't be the policy that we support. Because we, in, we, we inherently endanger those kids' lives at every level of the trip up here. And they don't come here kids anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. Hey, I have to say something. <laughs> in behalf of President Biden and Kamala Harris, they explicitly do not believe in open borders. And I don't either. And I voted for 700 miles of fencing. And now, once that was done, how do you then make sure without fencing that you can make sure you use high tech to, to control the border. So it's absolutely false to say that Democrats or Joe uh, believes in open borders. He has stated the border is closed right now. And to say that nobody came under Trump, you're forgetting those thousands of kids in those, in those horrible detention centers separated from, the, grabbed from their parents, oh my God. So, I mean, I, I this is where, see, working with Brian is always fun for me. And the beauty is how we respect each other, but I don't see it his way uh, in this particular time. Now, it is going to be rough and it is going to be tough because Joe does believe we're all God's children. There's no question about it. But we still have to have, we have a border. It has to be regulated. And I think once we get up and running, and had we done the Republican and Democratic approach in 2013, this, none of this would be happening. None of this. It's just tragic that that didn't happen. And we're in a mess. And Joe knows it, Kamala knows it, and, and everybody knows it. 
and they're admitting it. And I think we're going to get some reform. The House is trying now to do some bills. Um, I, I know it's, Europe is great. I'm sorry. I was going to say Europe has its issues too, and I'm mm -hmm. sure they're quite similar to this. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really great to see the diversity of opinions here in, in when it comes to, with regards to the roots and also the consequences. Because as you said, Senator, that's a really important point that it's not only an issue in the US, of course, it's a huge issue in Europe and also in Germany. Um, and I think that um, points out to how important it is to keep the transatlantic dialogue because we are all facing very similar issues. Exactly. Um, I could continue our conversation for much longer, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you all so much. Um, Morris, Brian, thank you so much for your time. David, so much. thank you so much for facilitating this. And Senator Boxer, it's been such a privilege and honor um, to get to spend uh, some time with you. Thank you for taking the time. And with that, I'll, I'll like to hand the, my virtual microphone back to David Deisner. Thank you, Marie Astrid, and um, also from my side, Senator, thank you so much for your thoughtful and really most inspiring remarks and for your passionate defense of the values of democracy, for your hope and your optimism. It was really just fascinating uh, to listen to you. And uh, as Marie Astrid just said, we could, could have gone on for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, we've covered a, a lot of ground, really. Um, uh, thank you also, Morris. Thank you, Brian, for joining this conversation. And again, thank you, David Noah, for your help in setting up this call. And of course, to you, Marie Astrid, for your brilliant moderation, well prepared and very thoughtful as well. Thank you so much to everyone and uh, have a good day in the US. Mm -hmm.